think that can do? Um, I don't know, I can relay emails. Relay emails. No? Okay, no. Um, it holds your emails. Holds your emails, yeah. Okay. So it's a mailbox server, Rob. That's all it is. It's, it's like a database server. Okay. Yeah, that's all it is. So it holds your data, it holds um, all your email. Do that. The next thing you've got is the hub transport role. That's the thing that's responsible for delivering email messages. Okay. So if you had a large organization, let's say ITV, so we've got a branch here. in America, we've got a branch here. We would have a mailbox server here and a hub transport server here. Okay. And over in America, they would also have a hub transport server and a mailbox server okay. as well. And so it goes to my mailbox, to my hub, to their hub, to their mailbox. Okay. So how, when <coughs> I send an email in then, how does it know which hub to go to first? Uh, what when you from the internet? Yeah. Okay, it's a good question. Yeah. So if you are sending an, an internet or a mail from the internet into my organisation, IT idiots, well, it's got to look at the MX records. Right. And it's wherever the MX record is going to point to. So okay. the MX record ultimately is going to point to one of the hub transport servers in your organisation, right. and that will be responsible. So that might look in Active Directory and say, oh, actually, it's not this hub transport server is not the best one. And that It'll might relay it to it another one. Okay. Now, that also could be an edge transport server as well, which okay. we haven't got to, but I will come up onto that. Okay. So really, the hub transport server is responsible for sending internet email messages. The next one down is the edge transport server. Edge. It, I don't know, it implies like something that sits between internal and external. Exactly. So it's, it's like an internet-facing hub transport server. That's what it is. Okay. So the hub transport server, the issue you've got with hub transport server, from a security point of view, it's, it's in Active Directory. So if someone compromises that, they might have access to Active Directory. Right. Now, if you think about it, your hub transport server has got to be exposed, otherwise you're not going to be able to receive internet email. Right. However, this is what the edge transport server does. So the edge transport server is a particular type of hub transport server. It's not even in the domain. It's a work group machine. So if that gets compromised, you can't really get much further. So the edge transport server, typically we use at work, we've got an edge transport server, all the emails come into that, so that's what the MX records are pointing to. Um, if the edge transport server dies, or if it fails, what are you going to do, what do you reckon? Build, build another one. Exactly, you're going to have two, and how are you going to balance between them? Okay. MX records, you know, so that's easy, isn't it? See, they see the consultants, they do nothing. Well, but, but you said that all of these can be installed on one server. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, with the exception of the edge transport server. <laughs> oh, that, that's okay, see, so again, you are listening, but talking about fl flipping back around, get away. Um, the edge transport server role, thinking about it, if you only got one thing, uh, one server that's receiving all the inbound email, you just have two of them, so easy. MX records, you just have two of them, and you can balance between them by giving the same weight. Okay. Um, hub transport server role, now, in an organisation, if we did have, let's say, uh, a site in England and a site in America, we would have to have a hub transport server here and one in America. Basically, it's one per AD site. Right. That's what you need. If we lose the hub transport server here, what do you think that's going to happen? We're not going to be able to send or receive email, are we? Mm -hmm. So how can we have high availability from the hub transport servers? Uh, have it redundant. Redundant? Have a redundant one, have two of them. Yes. Yeah, just have two of them. So like, do I need to network load button? No, I don't need to do that. Right. Because the mailbox server is going to look in the hub transport server and, so, and for submission, if that's not available, then it's just going to be submitted to another one. Okay. So just to be clear, those server names you see when you type the MX record thing, yeah. that points to the hub transport. That would be a hub or an edge transport. Or an edge, okay. Yeah, hub or an edge, depending on how big you are. So some organisations might choose a hub transport server. Because the argument they might have is they might be using some third party organisation, which if Mark's listening. No. No, they're not listening. <laughs> um, Mimesweep or something like that, some third party which is receiving the mail, it's doing all the virus scanning. Right. So it's deemed to be safe at that point, so it can quite happily be sent to a hub transport rather than an edge transport. Okay. So an edge is if we want to do it ourselves. Okay. And so when you said that you could assign the same weight to, let's say you've got two, mm -hmm. how does it load balance it then? Is it um, random? I, I'm not overly sure to be honest. I think it okay. might be round robin, it might be. I'm not okay, but that's sure. done at the DNS? It's, you know, it's done by the sending server. Okay. So I suppose that, that's something you can do. You can run an endless lookup and see. Oh, you see, you let me off on one now, see, <laughs> Oh, no, I won't get that far. Because I'll lose this. 
Okay. Anyway, so... We'll cover you, that another time. We'll cover it another time. So you've got your mailbox server role, uh, you've got your hub transport server role. For high availability, you have more hubs, easy. Edge transport server role, we have more of them, easy. Client access server role, so what do you think that's for? OWA. OWA, yeah. So it's, it's for accessing your mailbox. Now, in Exchange 2007, there was one situation where clients used to communicate directly with a mailbox server, and that was Outlook clients, or what is generally referred to as Mappy clients. Okay. They talked directly to the mailbox server. Now, that used to complicate things a little bit, because if you say, let's say I'm a mailbox server and you're a mailbox server, Outlook's communicating to me at the moment, because that's where my mailbox is. But if the mailbox has moved across to you, and the Outlook client has a little bit of an ecky about that, and it does have to time out, and then it will realise and move. But if you're running out the web access, or, or if you're going via the web, or you're communicating with client access server first. So the client access server just queries Active Directory, finds out what the mailbox is, and can forward it directly to that. Okay. So the big change in Exchange 2010 is that your MAPI clients now use the client access server role. So it's no direct access to the mailbox server role. Okay. So even now in Outlook, I know we can actually specify an HTTP kind of URL to connect back to Exchange Server, that's using the client access server. That is, yeah, that was one situation where Outlook did use to communicate with the client access server. So for example, myself, when I'm outside of the office using the Outlook anywhere, right. you are communicating with the client access server. Okay. But when you're sitting in, at, in the office, you're communicating directly with the mailbox okay. server on. But now it's just all connected? All web across the client access okay. server, which makes, makes sense, so much yeah. more sense. And you can see how that gives you the flexibility of moving the mailboxes between the back end and the clients yeah. that are communicating with it. You're getting this. <laughs> right, so um, mailbox role. We talked a lot about high availability, and again, when you're a consultant or when you're designing it, that's what you're interested in. High availability is, is yeah. primarily, or one of the prime reasons. To pay. Pay for something <laughs> decent to do. Sentence never really worked. So we worked at hub transport, that's easy. Edge transport, that's easy. Client access server. So your client access server, think about how people are going to access it. It's going to be via OWA. So if that IP address, if they're trying to go to one client access server and that fails, they're going to need to go to, to the other one. So you could give your users, right, go to this OWA server. If that fails, go to that one. Have you ever heard that happening? No. It doesn't happen. So network load balancing would be a solution to that. DNS. DNS. You could use Fit DNS as well, so network load balancing would be a nicer solution. Right, so that's what you could do in 2007 and pretty much 2010. Now, the mailbox server role is the thing that's changed a hell of a lot with high availability. Now, before in Exchange 2007, you could have high availability for the mailboxes by using things called LCR, CCR, and SCR. Okay, and these are the things which, again, all the consultants love doing loads of video diagrams. It, it, it's so hard to do these things, it's not really. Um, but yeah, apparently it's really, really hard to get these things running. So LCR, remember I showed you the animation slides the other day? Uh, vaguely. Yeah, they disappeared. <laughs> so LCR is a local continuous replication. This is useful when you've got, let's say, a single mailbox server. So I'm the mailbox server and it's local continuous replication. So I'm replicating to another disk on my server. Okay. So not bad, but um, not bad some people did it. But ultimately, of course, if the server dies, you've lost it. Okay. You know, you've lost this, this is purely for high availability? This is for a little bit of okay. high availability, yeah. So high availability for the mailboxes. So we, we've done it for hub transport and edge and client access, they're easy. It's, it's the mailbox, it's the harder one. So LCR is, is fine up until a point, but it doesn't really give us any protection if we lose that actual physical server. So that comes to CCR, Cluster Continuous Replication. So the nice thing about this, this is when we've got two mailbox servers. So I'm a mailbox server and you're a mailbox server. And as the mail's coming to me, it, it's transaction replication is what it is. Right. You know, so they come into me, I replicate across to you the changes and you can apply to your copy. So if any one point, if anyone dies, I keep on saying that word die, don't mm -hmm. I? So in, if the server goes down or work for whatever reason, it doesn't matter because you've got to replicate a copy. And that's all at SQL level? That's all at the data, it's all done at the database level, on, okay. on the Exchange so level. So Exchange uses a database at ESC, it doesn't use SQL. Okay, it doesn't use SQL. Okay. Now, and there's lots of talk about, will Exchange ultimately use SQL? Because it's been I a I thought really everybody would, but... Yeah, I, you would think, 